Amen? So good to see you this morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible, and we're going to jump in. I'm excited about the message today. We've been in this series we've called Brand New, and we're looking at uh, what it is to kick off this new year, this new decade, um, and our, our new lives in Christ. We said, you know, with Christ, we get a brand new start. We get a brand new identity. We talked about last week, we talked about a brand new family, and today we're going to talk about a brand new purpose. Uh, so this past uh, week, um, kind of a tender moment for us here. And if you haven't heard, one of our own staff members, as we see the addition of these who've come, um, Meg York passed away Monday night. And, uh, and we celebrated her life. Hundreds of us were here on Thursday uh, to celebrate her life. She was faithful to Jesus. And she loved the Lord. She had a heart for for missions here and around the world. She served in our missions really ministry and our in Espanol ministry. Uh, they're grieving uh, because they all knew her well, and many of you knew her as well. Um, John and Trish, siblings, John and Bev, many of you know, uh, have been longtime friends of our church and members here as well, now in Colorado. I believe they're here in the room today, but we just are grieving along with them and celebrating Meg's sweet life. But I think about this as we, as we uh, just celebrated her life on Thursday. Uh, that's the beauty and the blessing, probably the kind of the dark side, but the blessing, the grief and the joy of being a pastor as we walk alongside people and families. There have been so many times throughout my ministry where I'll do a, do a service, a memorial service, I'll be at a graveside, and then I'll head home to my wife or to my kids. And I'm thinking, you know, that, that's, that's me. That's me. It's coming. My day is coming in a moment and, and in an instant in light of eternity. And that's you as well. And so as we think about this new decade, frankly, I'm guessing crowd this side, some of us aren't going to make it out of this decade alive. Could be me. And so today I have an urgent message for us, for you to consider what your life really is all about. What is your purpose I could, I could offer it this way. What, what would be your epitaph? I mean, if people were doing your service, your funeral, what would you want them to say? Maybe in a word, maybe in a statement. What would it be for you? This is my epitaph. This is the summation of my life because that's what we're going to look at today. I, I've seen some of these, you know, uh, tombstones. Everybody's got some kind of tombstone written. In fact, if you take notes on sermons, I'd say take that even in the bulletin. You got some space there. If you have a journal, I want you to draw a tombstone and that will be where you place the points of this message today. Because I'm going to give you what I think all of us would hope and desire could be said about us. But I, I went online. I've, you know, seen some of these before. These are real epitaphs on tombstones. One of them said um, literally on, on marble. I told you I was sick. Maybe you've heard that one. Um, another one, th these are real. I, you can go online and see these. Raised four beautiful daughters with one bathroom and still there was love. Well, that's good. How about this one? I, I like this one. Now I know something you don't know. Wow. This is real. Here lies an atheist all dressed up and nowhere to go. That's on somebody's tombstone. I did a funeral of a man in uh, McKinney. He had Lou Gehrig's disease, so he was long process uh, of, of death. I visited him often in his home and watched him die. His son was a good friend of our son, Travis. And I did this funeral. I knew he was going to do this, but we had before the, before the funeral, there was an open casket. I don't know if you've ever been to a service like that, but people would come down and, and you know, literally like, there, there he is, you know, and then we closed the casket prior to the service. And so people would come by and, and I would stand there as, as the pastor, you know, and just be kind of a presence there. And, but every time they come by and they, they look and then they start giggling and then they come by and smile at me and, and what he had done, he, he's laying there and he, he had sunglasses on and then he had this, this card on his chest and it said, my future's so bright I'm going to need sunglasses. I, I, I wonder if you were to think about your own epitaph, what might it be? I saw some years ago, um, Ruth Graham uh, is now buried. Billy, of course, Graham married, buried beside her in Charlotte and saw her tombstone. And I've referenced it before, but her says, end of construction. Thank you for your patience. Isn't that great? What is it? What is 
What is a well-lived life? What is success for you? What will that be? How do you define success? Because the answer to that question is, is guiding your life every single day. Psalm 90 verse 12, it says, Lord, teach us to number our days aright that we might gain a heart of wisdom. That's another way of saying, help us to focus on what matters so that our lives will count. Give us wisdom in how we're going to live. So I've been thinking a lot about this and have referenced it in in public places along the way. And with our staff, we've been talking a lot about this. What is success? I've been thinking about this this past year. What is success? Uh, Personally, what is success for me? And first I was kind of asking, what is real success? You know, as a minister of the gospel, as a priest, and then I realized that's the wrong question. What is success in life? What is it? And for me, it's come down to one single word. Success is faithfulness. It's faithfulness. It's being faithful. In fact, many of you know at the end of the parable of the talents, I hear this a lot. This is all that I want to hear, you know, have said of me. It's often said at a funeral, and you can see it there. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. What does it mean to be faithful? What does that look like? And for me, it it really has come down to the fact that I'm just a steward of what God has given to me, and I'm going to be faithful every single day to what he's called me to. And for me, it means this. Whatever task he's given me today, I'm going to be faithful to him, the one who's faithful to me. And whomever he puts in front of me, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be focused, and I'm going to seek to be like Jesus in their presence. And that will be success for me. That'll be enough for me. I'll go home tonight, put my head on the pillow, and I'll say, I was faithful today. Don't know that I changed the world. Don't know that I you know, led everybody to Jesus across the globe. But I was faithful with what you put in front of me. And friends, I want that to be true of your life as well. So I want you to turn to Acts chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 17 through 38. Everybody now, grabbing your Bible, turn to Acts 20. And uh, pull out your notes, uh, pull out a journal, whatever else you got. And I want you to take some notes because I'm going to give you four marks of a faithful life. I'm believing with great passion today that if you, if you apply this message to your life, it's going to change your life. And someday off there when somebody, me, somebody else is doing your memorial service, doing your funeral, that your life will matter from this point on. And that you'll serve the Lord like you never have before as a result of this message. So here in the book of Acts, Acts 20, we see Paul's farewell speech. He's leaving Jerusalem. He's he's summoned the leaders of the church in Ephesus. He's been on this missionary journey. I mean, he's planted churches. He's been years at it. Last week, we looked at his relationships in his life with Barnabas and Timothy was introduced and and we saw Lydia and the people he's impacted all the way around. And now he's about to go to Jerusalem and he's going to leave these people whom he loves so much. He's poured in their lives and he's going to talk about now, hey, here's my epitaph. It's kind of a summation of his ministry among them. And so the first mark that I want you to see, the first mark of a faithful life is this, and I put it in, in in the personal pronouns, I stayed humble. I stayed humble. Look at Acts 20, 17 through 21. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, so here it starts. And by the way, I mean, literally, I think they're at the dock. Like I'm about to get on this ship right here. So I'm gathering everybody together one last time. You yourselves know, because at the end of the speech, that's literally what happens. You yourselves know how I lived among you The whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. So he had these antagonistic Jews, people coming against him. And he said, you know, I I sought to be humble among you with humility, all humility and with tears. Notice how humility and tears are mixed together. If you're going to remain humble, it means you're going to, the word, we get the word humiliated. The word is humus in the, in the Latin. It means literally, it means earth. It means dirt. I'm going to be the lowest one among you. And friends, that is, that's a hard way to live. And he loved these people so much that he was in tears often with tears and with trials because I just sought to be humble. 
See, the first and arguably the most important trait of a faithful life is to be humble. And I can tell you, when we look at staff members and people to come and lead us, we look, you know, we, the first thing, and I told Han, the first thing we're looking for is a humble man, a humble woman. And, and if you're not humble, you're, you're going to stand out, frankly, on our team. That's the word that would mark our staff and our team, our church. We want to be humble. Because in James 4, 6, it says this, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How can you live a faithful life if God, if God is opposed to you? Would people describe you as humble? Well, what does that look like? Well, he's shown us in the work that he's, that he's done, and he, it means that he's going to be faithful. A new purpose means that you have a new posture, a new attitude, a new quality about you. And nowadays, you know, um, man, we just, we're always kind of pumping our chest and, you know, look at me, look at me. But he says, all humility and with tears, I've served you. I've been humiliated at times because I've sought justice and love and care for people. I've died to myself and that's hard. And so Paul lived this kind of life. I wonder if that would mark you. I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Gosh, how we need that in our day, don't we? This is so needed. We, we said a couple of weeks ago that you know, our identity is secure in Christ. So, so I'm, I'm confident in him. See, being humble doesn't mean that I'm just, I mean, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm going to just be so lowly, just pushing everybody in front of me. It means that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve him confidently, but not in, my own, not, not in my own power, but in his power. I'm secure in Christ. I'm totally forgiven. I'm fully you know, accepted by him. That's what defines me. So I I don't need to be loved by everybody else. You see, all the love I need, I've found in Christ. This is why John the Baptist says, I must become less so that he might become greater. A humble person is just pushing Jesus, you know, higher and higher. You're just just walking around, spilling Jesus on everybody because you're so filled up with him. You're spilling Jesus all over the place. But you're seeking to be humble. See, humility, think about this. Humility, weakness, and tears. Is this how we define the leaders in our nation today? Is this how we define people who are great leaders? Man, that guy's a great leader. The great leader in the kingdom of God is humble, filled with tears, suffering, and trials. Those are the marks of the great leader in the kingdom of God. 200 times this word is used in the Bible. And all of the time, it means low, defeated, and weak. It means humble. But outside of the gospel, this Greek word that we see in the New Testament, it really does, it means low, defeated, weak. But in the gospel, the word has power. Why is it that a word outside the gospel is an insult is what it was? But inside the gospel, it's a virtue. Because in the kingdom, it's the upside down kingdom of God. Many of us were, were, were at an MLK walk yesterday, uh, uh, down the uh, MLK Boulevard. We were among the poorest of the poor in our city, in South Dallas. You go among the poor, and, and places I've been around the world, and some of you, many of you have been, and you realize what Jesus meant when he said, you've done it. To the least of these, you've done it unto me. Jesus so identifies with the humble and the needy and the broken that he shows up, which is why so many of us who are so affluent and so, you know, have all things in North Dallas, we've got to get ourselves outside of ourselves. Why we push you all the time to serve others because they're the ones who are teaching us because Jesus shows up there. I love what Tim Keller said. Look at this. He says, a humble and weak person will show a crucified savior better to a listener than a polished, pulled together expert. Because that's how it happened for us. Think about it. We weren't saved by pulling ourselves together, but by admitting we were sinners and calling on the one who was pulled apart for us. That's how we lead people to Jesus. See, for me to stand up in front of you or whoever your audience might be, friendships you have, maybe it's your family. For me to stand up here and tell you how awesome I am, that doesn't serve you one bit. But if I can share my weakness, if I can be humble before the Lord, then I can point you to the one that I'm trusting in. Because, you know, again, I mean, I, I want it. I've always said it. I prayed it when I first got here. You know, follow me as I follow Jesus. But I'm simply to point you to him. And so in, in, in sharing our weakness, being humble, you're pointed to him and seeing how great and mighty he is. So listen, I was humble. Is that true of you? 
And then secondly, I spoke the truth. Look at verse 20. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both, both to Jews and to the Greeks of, of, of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I spoke the truth. I spoke the truth in love. First Timothy 2, 7, Paul says, I'm just a herald for Christ. That's what I am. I'm, I'm Christ herald. Paul, by his own admission, didn't, didn't pretend to be the most brilliant person on the planet, though I could argue he was incredibly bright, but he was just a servant. By his own estimation, though, you know, I'm, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a moralist. I'm not this great leader. Some said he wasn't much to look at, you know, that kind of thing. And yet he humbled himself, but he had one message to proclaim, and it was the message of Jesus. And he stayed faithful to it. He added nothing. He altered nothing. He left out nothing. He omitted nothing. All he talked about he, was Jesus. And this is what we saw in Meg York's life. Recently, she was um, sent over to a rehab area after a uh, time in a hospital. And, and we told her, you know, you're going to have to go uh, over there and rehab before you get strong enough to come. And she says, hey, just give me another mission field. Every person who came into her room, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Now, some of you might think, that's kind, of, that's kind of radical. Like, how many of us do that? That's all that matters right now for Meg. That's all that matters. And so it matters. It's all that matters for people in our lives, in our families, in our workplace, our students who are inviting friends to come to getaway weekend or come on Sundays to say, listen, I want you to know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? And I'm pleading with some of you, even today, maybe you're here today and you've not received his grace. Paul is faithful to a singular message. But look at what it says in Ephesians 4, 15. He wrote this, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is head, who's the head, into Christ. Now, some of us, we look at that and we go, well, I'm just speaking the truth in love. I'm just speaking the truth in love. No, you're just trying to win an argument. You're just kind of boldly expressing your opinion is what you're doing. Not a lot of love. We're not, we're not here to win arguments. We're here to win people to Jesus. And the pathway to Jesus is always love. Always. And so we love others, but we speak the truth. Paul himself said, man, without love, just noise. And how much noise are we hearing in our culture today? That's why I love our students who are just getting away for a weekend. Some of us need to practice you know, this, this, this discipline of solitude in our own lives, just noise. But hey, I stayed humble. I spoke the truth. Thirdly, I did not give up. I did not give up. This is a challenge for some of us today. This is a word for some of us here. Look at verse 22. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there. Except that the Holy Spirit, watch this, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, I got a hunch. Watch this. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Paul's like, I don't know what's going to go down, but I'm probably going to end up in jail. Because I got one message and some people don't want to hear it, but I'm compelled to go. He knew what was coming. It was going to be hard. And yet he stayed the course and he did not give up. This is the man who wrote, I have been crucified with Christ. And so, so it, it's, it's not me who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Here's the point. Paul died before he got here to this point. And, and I, I just want to challenge all of us. Have you truly died to yourself? And yes, it's a daily thing. But Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, let him, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross daily, die, and then follow me. Who, who wants some of that? Let's have an invitation. Come forward, die, and whatever comes your way, you remain faithful. That is the Christian life, and that is great joy as we serve our Savior. So Paul was this amazing man committed to Christ. Whatever comes to me this week, I'm, I've already died. I mean, even death itself can't take me. I'm already dead. No. I'm already alive in him. I'm already alive and you can't take anything from me. Look at verse 24. But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel 
of his grace. He's saying, you've been faithful to me. I have been faithful to you. That's all that I want to be said in my life. I was faithful. And see, this language, the faithfulness language, this is the language of, of a steward, not the master. The master is in charge of success or failure. The steward is simply to do the master's bidding. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, he says a steward is to be found faithful. See, so this stuff of success and failure, these are concerns of the master, not the steward. Friends, think about what God has given to you. Something, and it's probably your anxieties and your worries point you to, to your idols, to your struggles. But you're trying to be God. It might be your work. It might be your family. Maybe your children. Maybe it's a vocational challenge or relational challenge. Whatever it is that's stressing you out, success or failure is not on you. It's on the Lord. It's on the master. The steward's not concerned about the house. It's the master's house. It's like a money manager. It's not your money. You're simply to steward that money. Faithfulness is the concern of the steward. Success is given by the master. See, see, most of us, we think in our day, man, especially in this day of social media, a lot of us, and I'm tempted to go here too. We thought, what, what, what's the big, we're going to have the biggest impact. We're going to have the biggest impact. And that, that's worth noting. Utilizing your gifts, leveraging them for the kingdom to have great impact. But you know what I've learned this is where getting old, you know, older helps you out a little bit. I have learned that God simply has called me to one part of this thing. If we're building a wall, this is my section right here. Not, not your section. You know, not, not that section down there. He's called me to be faithful right here, right where I am. That, that is a freeing thing, friends. Some of, I got, we got to save the whole world. Well, the gospel is going to go to the whole world, and we want to be a part of that. But each one of us has passions. Each one of us are going hard, running to different people groups and people and, and influences that we, we have in our lives, at workplace and friends and others. We can all do this together, but you're simply faithful to do what he's called uh, you to do right now. What is in front of you right now? We talked about it last week. Who are the people who are in front of you right now? that he's called you to serve. And just a, just a word, you know, for some of us here, maybe some of you, some of you young moms or, you know, young, young dads, I think a lot of us here, the biggest impact that you have in these days is simply the daily persevering of pouring into your children. The greatest thing you'll ever do in life may not be something you do, but someone you raise. The same is true at your workplace. You may not be able to win everybody at work, but you can win one who might win the rest. Are you doing your part? Are you being faithful with those who he's put right in front of you? And so, friends, I just want to encourage you through, through, through mounds of, of laundry or paying bills and the struggles of daily life, just be faithful right where you are. and Stop looking at somebody else's section of the wall. He's given you something to be faithful to today. The whole key to life is finding out what God has you to do and to do it with all your heart to be faithful. That will be success. That's enough. And so I just want to encourage you and release you today. Look at what it says in verse 25. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink back. I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Now, he's actually referenced in Ezekiel 33. Uh, there's a, a passage in verse 8. It talks about the watchman, the watchman on the wall who is to call out when the enemies are coming. Hey, it's certain death if we don't like step up right now. We've got to do something. He's saying, I've been faithful. He's not washing his hands. It's not like, hey, I've been faithful. Your blood's not on me. He's referencing Ezekiel and he does so. Look at this. It's not, it's not this kind of a, hey, uh, uh, the watchman, I did my job. And some people have this kind of attitude, right? I spoke the truth. Um, if they don't come to Christ, that's on them, not me. Friends, listen, Paul is presenting the gospel with tears. 
He's presenting the word of truth. He's saying, be clear, be, speak the truth, but do it in love. He's saying, I've been faithful with my part of the wall. I was a watchman. I, I, I said, listen, judgment is coming. But friends, if we're going to preach judgment and talk to people who are in need of grace to overcome, to, 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 to you know, not be found before God, the judgment of God is holiness upon all of us apart from Christ. Let's do it in t- with tears. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He says this, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees imploring them to stay. And if hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go unwarned, unprayed for. We share the gospel with passion, with urgency, but with tears, longing for everybody to come to faith. May this be said of us. God's called us as a church to be faithful in the city right now. He's placed us here with great resource to launch churches, to plant new churches, to serve the poor, to be, to be a bridge of racial reconciliation and justice across our city, and to love all people. But friend, I want to ask you, are you faithful to those who he's put in front of you? And God forbid that we don't, we're not clear with our family members about the gospel, that we would share the gospel and not wait Who has God put in your life? We looked at it last week. Who's your Macedonian man? Who is your people group? Who's that person he's placed in your heart and your life? Here's what I've seen. And this this has been the challenge in my own life. When I want to give up, it's it's probably for a few reasons. Um, It's pain and suffering. This life is hard at best sometimes. And serving Jesus can be really difficult. And there have been so many times, Lord, I don't know. I don't know if I can keep going. I think, I think pain, I think, uh, I think this, you know, could, could be misunderstood. I think fatigue, this is tiring. I think um, undivided hearts is the thing that knocks so many of us out. I want to serve Jesus, but man, it gets a little crazy working with people. I don't like people that much. I, I can't, I just can't. You know, I know we need some people to help serve our students, but students are a little bit crazy. I mean, they might, you know, demand a little time from me. So I, we want to have both and we wonder why we lack joy and purpose in our lives. Man, I love, I love kids, but not that much. I mean, I like my comfort a little bit more. I I love my comforts and, and all the safety that comes with me just kind of staying over here. And yet the Lord's calling us out to do other things. And, and nowadays we can, you know, we go on social media and like something and we kind of feel good about it. Like we did something. I'm for that. Bam. Like that. That's amazing. Like, and we're doing nothing. So what has God called you to do? What is your ministry and how will you be faithful to him? I love Psalm 86, 11. It says, teach me your way, Lord that I may rely on your faithfulness, right? That's our motivation. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Give me an undivided heart. Undivided heart. Let me focus on you and what you've placed in my life. Let me be faithful and that will be enough for me. So I just want to encourage you all, be faithful. Where's your place in the kingdom? Go hard at it one day at a time, friends, one day at a time. Look at verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. He's speaking to leaders in the church to care for the church of God. And this is all of us, which he obtained with his own blood. So maintain your spiritual health. He now turns to them. He says in verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things. To draw away the disciples after them. He's saying, be alert. Don't give up. Stay faithful. And then verse 31. Therefore, be alert. Remembering that for three years I did not cease the night or day to admonish everyone with tears. There are the tears again. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I'm going to 
I'm going to pause for a minute in this message and just give you a real clear application. Uh, you received this card when you came in. I want you to pull it out right now. Would you pull this card out? You have it there. You got a bulletin. And I'm going to, I'm going to just walk you through this briefly as the application point. One more point in the message, but we'll wrap it up here in a moment. I want you to take this out. And this is for you, by the way. This is for you. So I want you to think about this. Put it in your Bible. Take it with you. Some of you can fill this out even now, but I want you to commit. We thought this would be a good time. Commit here as we move into this year and into 2020, the next decade. You know, how can I stay the course? Well, you've got to do something. You've got to commit to these things in order to stay the course, remain healthy and not give up. And so I, I just challenge you. I pray regularly for PCBC and the kingdom work. How often will you pray? I want you to challenge yourself to say, I'm going to pray every morning for my church family, or I'm going to pray three times a week or whatever that might be. You put it there in that, in that blank. Some of these are just for you. Okay. I will, I will be in worship with fellow believers. I want you to put frequency. Maybe, maybe this is your place. This is where you worship. Many of us need to commit to weekly worship. It should be the pattern of every believer. I will serve regularly in this ministry. Can you, oh, the group, the group piece. If you're not in a group, who are you doing life with? What group are you with? Other believers that you're doing life with. And then you can see there the ministry. What ministry are you a part of? And if some of your longtime members are like, ah, got this, got this. No, 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 no. Do this, write it down, and see how God is leading you to perhaps expand your influence, or maybe he's calling you to something new. I will mentor and disciple someone. Who's that going to be? Who's your Timothy? Who are you going to pour into? Who will that be? And then you're going to give financially. If you don't give God everything when you have nothing, you're probably going to give him nothing when you have everything. Start where you are. If you have a little, give a little. If you have some, give some. If you have a lot, give a lot. That's what he's called us to do together. Okay, so be clear about that. Have conversations, maybe with a, with a friend or a spouse. I will support the mission efforts of our church by. You can pray. You can give. You can go. Some of you, this will be the year where you go on your first mission trip you've ever been on. Or maybe you're going to repeat again. I will pray and focus on building relationships with people who don't know Jesus. Write down the name of a person that does not know the Lord. Okay? Do that. And then uh, finally, here's what I want to do as we press on. Please take that and be serious about that piece. I stayed humble. I spoke the truth. I did not give up. And then finally, I gave more than I took. I gave more than I took. Verse 33, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus. Look how he finishes this. He said himself, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. I'm going to ask the band to come up and we're going to, we're going to sing a song together as we close our time. I'm going to ask the question, what do you want your life to be about? What are you building your life on these days? What is it? Um, perhaps today's the day of commitment for you. I believe that it is for all of us in varying degrees in some way. It's more blessed to give than receive. I'm going to ask you in your marriage, are, are, are you giving more than you're taking? At work, are you thinking about how you can give more than you take? In your neighborhood, among your friends, in your relationships, are you a giver or are you a taker? Paul closes his, his speech with the words of Jesus. It's more blessed to give than receive. And then it goes on to say that they, they all gathered around him. And they prayed over him. They kissed him. They were sorrowful because of the words they had spoken, that he had spoken when he said, hey, I'm not going to be with you all anymore. I'm not going to see you again. And so he, he lays this, this kind of outline of his life out, what he wants it to be about. He said, I'm going to stay humble. I'm going to speak the truth. I'm, I'm not going to give up. And I'm going to give more than I take. Maybe said of us, Friend, I want us to commit our hearts and our lives to Jesus. So let's, let's do this. Let's all pray together. I want to bow our heads and we're going to sing a song together. We're just going to, before we run out, don't, don't run out. We're going, to, we're going to just sing for just a couple of minutes and proclaim to the Lord that we're going to build our life on Him 
and him alone. So Paul's heading to Jerusalem. He predicted a few times that things aren't going to go well for him. He had some disciples praying over him. He said, I'm ready to die. I, I, I'm, I've, I've given up my life already. Jesus headed to Jerusalem one last time as well. He predicted his death. He knew it was coming. And on the night of his betrayal, even his disciples they didn't stay with him, pray with him. He went to the cross alone. He was abandoned so that you would never be. He was punished so that you would never be punished for your sin. He's taken away the power of sin in your life so you can live a new and resurrected life now. And he's calling us simply to respond to his love. Let us be faithful. Faithful. Lord, we will build our lives on you. You are the only sure foundation. It's in your name we pray.